Yeah! We're bike. We're big fucking bike. With part two of our early running back rankings series. In my last video, we ripped through running backs 1 through 10 for the 2022 fantasy football season. So if you missed it, make sure you go watch that first and foremost. So you're not left clueless out here like all my fucking employees. We are going to be doing this same thing with wide receivers and quarterbacks and tight ends after this video. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you don't hate the video. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. Listen. <laughs> Picking bike up where we left last video at number 11. Hard to rank this guy outside of your top 10, man. But I done did it. I have him at number 11. That's James Conner of the Arizona Cardinals. 202 carries, 750 rushing yards, 15 rushing touchdowns, an extra 375 through the air, three more touchdowns, and 37 catches. So we're looking at uh, over 1,000 total yards, over 1,100 total yards, and 18 touchdowns. This dude was legitimately great for fantasy teams last year, okay? They re-signed him to a three-year, $21 million deal. I'm really not sure there's a point of even discussing Connor as a player last year. I mean, I, I can talk in, in circles and, and convince y'all that he's actually not a good running back. I can tell y'all that his 752 rushing yards ranked 27th in the NFL last year. I can tell y'all that his PFF rushing grade ranked 30th among running backs. I could tell y'all that he was 34th in yards after contact per attempt. His breakaway run rate was 39th in the NFL. His elusiveness was number 19 in the NFL among running backs. His yards per touch ranked 27th. His true yards per carry when adjusted for offensive line and all that stuff ranked 62nd in the NFL among qualified running backs. See, like I could say all that. I could say some shit like his 2021 year was eerily similar to Mark Ingram's 2019 season. I mean, we look at we look at the totals here. I mean, Mark Ingram was even better, and then he falls off. I could say all that, but I'm just not going to do it. Because I don't think it matters. Chase Edmonds is gone. James Conner is the central everything in this backfield, right? Keontae Ingram, cute six-rounder. Eno was cool. Daryl Williams, not cool. I like Eno, but I think uh, they've been pretty fucking clear about just how much they don't want to use him in Arizona, unfortunately. Keontae Ingram, again, sixth-round pick. Like, are we really expecting a six-round guy to come in and take work from James Conner, who just scored 18 touchdowns. He still has yet to play a full season in the NFL. Uh, he's missed at least two games in every single year. But looking back at since Cliff has gotten into Arizona, he wants someone to get 20 touches per game. He wants someone to absolutely dominate goal line carries. It was Kenyon Drake, it's James Conner. And given the contract that James Conner just got from Arizona, clearly Cliff wants that to be him. So if you think he's going to get injured, sure, whatever. If you think he's going to get overtaken by someone else in the backfield, it ain't happening. If he's on the field, he's going to do big things volume-wise. As per his efficiency numbers, I didn't say all what I just said. Number 12, and rounding out the RB1s of the 2012 season, Nicholas Chubb, Cleveland Browns. He's been consistently great. No reason to think anything changes this year with him. I know all the heroes out there are going to be like, you're too low on Nick Chubb. I'm not. Unless we get word that Deshaun Watson is playing the full season, I'll move him up then. But only then. Chubb has con consistently finished as like a low-end RB1 in fantasy year over year over year, and that's where I'll draft him, all right? He's averaged five yards per carry plus in every single season he's been in the NFL, the four years. There's no debate he's as good of a pure runner as anybody on the face of planet Earth in the Western Hemisphere on the fucking Milky Way galaxy. You will not get a debate from me on that. But he's also averaged 1.6 receptions per game in his career, and he scored eight rushing touchdowns in three out of the four seasons he's been in the NFL. So we're talking about a guy who doesn't catch passes. Good at scoring touchdowns, but not great, right? He's not scoring those 15 to 18 touchdown seasons. That's like where real upside comes. And that's how Zeke or Derrick Henry or Adrian Peterson, who don't catch passes, finish as the RB1, 2, or 3 overall. Uh, and we haven't seen that with Chubb. Again, if Deshaun Watson's under center, that could very well happen because he's got the elite offensive line. He'll have a, an incredible offense with a great playmaker at quarterback. The touchdown opportunities could present themselves there. But outside of that, you shouldn't be drafting guys without upside higher than where their upside is. That might have went over some of y'all's heads, but some of you guys are smart enough to understand, okay? So Nick Chubb, my RB12. Do I think he'll finish higher than that? Yeah, probably. But do I think he'll finish much higher than that? Probably not. And that's why I have him down at 12, safe spot, safe player, great player, not RB1 overall finish type upside with Kareem Hunt in the backfield. Number 13, Aaron Jones. I went in on Aaron Jones in the must draft running back video from last week, which will be linked down below. So make sure you go check that out. Uh, to summarize, realistically, like when Devontae Adams is not on the field, Aaron Jones sees almost seven targets a game, 55 receiving yards per game. He immediately becomes the most trusted weapon for Aaron Rodgers in this Packers offense. I think there's a there's a, a chance that we see 
Aaron Jones take like what Austin Eckler was for the first few years of his career, that type of role where he's running 30 to 35% of his snaps in the slot or out wide, like becomes a receiver basically for this team. And that's going to be huge for PPR upside in fantasy football. So yes, AJ Dillon's going to eat a little bit more into the workload. This will probably be a little bit more of a run heavy team, which could be good for Aaron Jones. Dillon's going to see a lot of goal line carries, but I think his involvement in the passing game is going to make Aaron Jones like a phenomenal pick here as the RB 13 that you're going to get as your, you know, your, your RB2, or if you fade running backs all together, you can get him as your RB1 in the third, fourth round of drafts. After Aaron Jones, we have my RB14, Saquon Barkley. Mm, didn't want to say it out loud. Saquon. Saquon Barkley. I mean, what uh, what is there to say? I, I, I really don't know. Uh, I'll just repeat the statement that Saquon had over 2,000 yards from scrimmage as a rookie until someone just comes and kills me. I'll just keep saying that over and over again. I'll keep wrongly betting on it the situation stinks the offensive line stinks the quarterback stinks and at this point i don't even know if i if saquon stinks or not but i'm willing to find out he was our number one player in our draft guide last year on the all fade list not our number one player our number one on the all fade list so wanted nothing to do with saquon last year because he was going six overall now you're starting to see him drop to the third or fourth round i'm comfortable you know when you start to balance out the range of outcomes on the spectrum the ceiling's probably not there but to get him in the third or fourth round, I'm in on Saquon there, man. Speaking of the draft guide, if you want the draft guide, all you got to do is go sign up on Prize Picks using our promo code. Go to prizepicks.com. If you deposit $10 or more using BDGE, they're going to double your deposit, first of all. And you're going to get free access to our draft guide, which has all of our rankings in it, running backs positional, the big board of 200, um, plus all of our like must draft players, the all fade list, etc. So go to prizepicks.com. Use promo code BDGE when you do so. If you're not in a prize picks eligible state, you could just go over to bdge.co, bdge.co, and you can cop it straight from the source. From I was going to say the sauce, the source, the horse's mouth. It all just combined into one fucking word there. Regardless, everything is combined into one when you just go to prizepicks.com, use promo code BDGE, deposit $10 or more. You won't regret it. You might regret taking Ezekiel Elliott, but I have him ranked 15. Okay. Zeke is super interesting this year. I think he could be a key to fantasy leagues this year. I really, really do. And I know people have been saying that for a couple of years, but let me make the case for Zeke up at RB50. He actually finished last year. I don't think a lot of people know this. He finished last year as the RB6 overall in fantasy in half PBR. That came at the cost of the points per game, right? RB6 overall, overall doesn't paint the picture because he finished as RB18 when you look at fantasy points per game. Massive drop off, of course. Big fucking yikes, okay? Uh, I think there are... are a bunch of pl- uh, a bunch of factors at play here. One of them, and probably the biggest thing, is that Zeke started off red fucking hot last year. He had this shit game against uh, Tampa Bay in Week One, where no running back has. To, they were an elite. Remember how elite Tampa Bay's run defense was last year, uh, entering last year. He had the shit Week One against Tampa Bay, but after that, 17, 25, 20, 24, 15 fantasy points. Well on his way to top five running back fantasy numbers, uh, and then he tore his PCL around like Week Five, and he decided to play through it. And to be honest, I don't I don't know if Zeke is that good of a runner anymore. I really don't. Uh, and surely a, a torn PCL will zap some of your explosiveness. And on top of that, we're going on like two straight years of pretty underwhelming production out of Zeke, which you can make excuses for. I think I think the excuses here for Zeke are somewhat valid. But I think the most important storyline here that no one's talking about right now that will eventually become chalk, and I like to uncover these things earlier on in the offseason, is the, the same Aaron Jones corollary that I just made. Devontae Adams is gone. And a lot of the targets are now going to go to Aaron Jones. With Amari Cooper gone, Michael Gallup coming back from very, very late season ACL tear. Who knows if he's going to start the the year on the pup list, if he's going to start out slow, whatever the case may be. Zeke is going to see a huge uptick in targets in this offense, right? He's He had it 65 last year. He had 71 in each of the previous two seasons, 95 the year before that. Like, they have no problem setting this guy up with dump offs, the screen passes, with plays down the field. Zeke is going to be receiving the same benefits that Aaron Jones is going to receive with Devontae Adams off the field, with Amari Cooper gone, with Michael Gallup coming back from injury. Like, this is a very, very underplayed storyline that needs to be put out into the public a little bit more, okay? So I think Zeke's actually going to have as much, if not more, value in PPR leagues, which is not something typically you would think about when it comes to Zeke. So I'm, I'm biking in on Zeke where he's going right now. He's going in like the fourth, fifth round of drafts, and that I, I'm all in on, okay? Javante Williams, I'm not sure if I'm all in on. Uh, the story here is, is is pretty simple. It's Melvin Gordon resigns. We wanted Javante to be the workhorse. He was awesome last year on basically every per touch, per snap efficiency metric you're going to find. But here's here's the truth of the fact, the matter of the fact of the truth of the fucking the, everything. So was Melvin. Melvin was good. Just because you're talented does not mean you become the workhorse, right? And we're clearly seeing that in Denver. Talent does not always equal 
opportunity. Your talent level does not always equal your opportunity level, and that's what this is here. Uh, you know, Russ coming in obviously spikes the entire offense in total, and you want pieces of this offense. I, I made the video uh, last week, our must draft wide receiver video, which you guys should go check out. We'll link that in the description as well. And I said, I'm basically going to, I'm not going to be able to predict who I want, who's better, Judy or Sutton. I personally like Sutton more than Judy. I think it's crazy that Judy is clearly going ahead of Sutton in drafts. Regardless, I want to leave every fantasy draft I'm in this year with one of those two, with either Judy or Sutton, because I don't know who's going to win, but I want one of them. And I probably want Javante Williams more often than I don't want him, okay? So you're, of course, going to take Javante straight up over Melvin Gordon. No one's arguing that shit. And he'll have his big weeks, man. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a stretch where Melvin misses time and Javante goes for like 25 points per game for, for a stretch of like three to five games and just wins you weeks, well, week over week over week. He'll be very good on his own too. Uh, probably between 10 and 13 fantasy points per game like he was last year, a little bit boost up because the touchdown numbers will probably spike with Russ under center. Um, I think he'll take over more of the 1A role, but make no mistake here, this is not going to be a 70% snap share for Javante Williams. He's not getting the workload that we wanted him to get prior to Melvin Gordon signing. So there is risk here in assuming a ceiling. That's that's the risk you have in Javante. As a player, not a lot of risk. Workload, going to be there. But the upside workload might not. So I think you bake that in. And talking about risk, you want to risk your health? You stare at your cell phone all night. You're in bed. You're looking at our TikToks, looking at our Instagram, looking at our Twitter. You're watching me right now on YouTube, 10 p.m. at night. You shouldn't be doing that. If you're going to do that, make sure you have a pair of blue light blocking glasses. Now, Felix Gray makes the best blue light blockers out there. High quality. They're a luxury pair, if you must say. They're a little bit more expensive, but when you use a promo code BDG15, you're getting 15% off your purchase. I promise if you go on Amazon and you get blue light blockers that are like $10, $12, $15, they are emitting a lot of light through them. There's a reason that they could charge you that, that little of a price. It's because the material they're using is shit. Cost them fucking a dollar to make the glasses because the light goes right through them, all right? Just because they get an orange tint on them doesn't mean they're blue light. And the best part about Felix Gray, one of the 19 best parts about them, is they don't have the orange tint on them. They look like regular glasses. So not only are they stylish and they make someone dumb look smart, but they actually do their job because they're made with high quality material. Okay. It blocks the blue light from your screens at night. So it allows your body to produce melatonin. It says, okay, we're not getting a lot of light right now. It must be nighttime. It must be dark time. Let me start getting Nick's body into sleep mode. We don't fucking sleep over here, but if we did, these would be the best product out. So what you guys are going to do for your health, for your safety, and for lack of risk, you're going to go to felixgray.com. You can use the link down below in the description. And you're going to use promo code BDG15 when you check out for 15% off your purchase. I believe they got free shipping going on right now as well. So you're getting a hell of a discount to keep yourself healthy. All right? Felixgray.com. The anti-cam acres of this year. Acres is my running back 17. I have a lot of concerns about acres. There's no one more in on acres pre-torn Achilles than me. There was no one more worried about Cam Akers post Achilles tear than this guy. My concern with Akers, and I, I just feel like people are not like understanding or wrapping their head around this, is that we'll never actually find out what he was going to be pre Achilles tear, which I think was going to be a top tier NFL running back, or at least a top tier fantasy running back. He didn't even have to be efficient or good, but great offense, three down skills, et cetera, et cetera. So he he miraculously returns from this Achilles tear last year in week eighteen. And then he plays week 18 all the way through their four games in the playoffs. And a lot of people are just like naively going to say, well, now he's got an extra offseason, six months to rest. The problem is there's no scientific research that says that players return to 100% of what they were prior to the Achilles tear. Most say the exact opposite. Most say that they lose a lot of their explosiveness. Just because you recovered and were able to play at a quicker rate does not mean you reached 100% of what you were. Okay. More rest does not mean that you can surpass a level of altitude of, of what player you were. Okay. So say he tears his Achilles and because that Achilles tear, what happens with these serious injuries is your body starts to accumulate uh, scar tissue in these areas. And some of them can never recover to what they were prior. It's fucking scientific. Again, only technically a doctor, but I could speak on it because I've been doing this for long enough. And I speak with a lot of the fancy doctors in the space it builds up. And then sometimes it can never become what it was. And if that's the case, it doesn't matter if he had six weeks rest, six months. I'm talking about after the season, not from when the injury happened, obviously. Six weeks, six months, six years rest. You still can never hit the same normalized uh, Achilles area in your body that it was pre-injury. That's my concern with Cam Akers. And the reason I'm concerned is because he was fucking horrible when he came back last year from the Achilles tear. I don't think people are realizing just how bad he really was. His yards per carry total in those five games, 0 0.6, 3.2, 2.0, 3.7, and 1.6. He had that 140-yard long catch down the sideline on broken coverage. Outside of that, 
his yards per reception numbers in those games, 3.3 yards per reception, 3.3, 6.7, 2.0, 4.7. In that five-week span that he played his five games, among 43 qualified running backs, he had the second most rushing attempts behind only Elijah Mitchell. He had the second worst yards per carry rate behind only Rex Burkhead. He had the most fumbles. He had the single worst PFF rushing grade. He was 29th in elusiveness. You could paint the picture however you want for Cam Akers, but it is a fact that there was beer spilled on the picture and it was messed up. Now, Darrell Henderson is still in LA. Sonia Michelle is gone. Kyron Williams, kind of cute, but not a real concern to me. The concern here for me right now is that the same concern that I had about CEH going into last year. We just don't actually know if Cam Akers is going to be good at running, at the running back position. You know, I'm also a bit hesitant to say that he was even good pre-Achilles tear in the NFL, right? As a rookie, it was small sample size, of course, and he had good explosive plays where he looked good. But efficiency-wise, like, he wasn't really that good, especially compared to the other runners in LA's backfield. Like, Darrell Henderson outplayed him when they both got the same amount of work in his rookie year. I'll let, I'll let y'all decide that for yourselves. I'm not, like, fading Akers at this point, but don't think that Akers doesn't come with massive risk this year because I think he does. I think he comes with the same risk that CEH came with last year where he just does not perform well. And over the long run, whether that's six or eight weeks down the line, they just start using other running backs a little bit more. Kyron Williams starts getting two to three targets a game. Darrell Henderson starts getting eight to 10 carries a game. Before you know it, you have a little bit of a committee there and it's hard to predict the outcome you, uh, week over week. Like that is my concern with Cam Akers. None of this shit is black and white, but it can get messy really, really quickly. And you don't want to be drafting like a top 15, top 12 running back who starts becoming like a borderline sit-start question as a flex play. That's the last thing you want. And that's what might happen with David Montgomery, who's my RB18. I know it's going to piss a lot of people off, but the Bears are just not an offense that I'm willing to put like top four to five round fantasy draft capital in this year. Like I like Mooney. I'll have some Mooney, but he's going later in drafts. That's probably about it. I think we know what we're getting with David Montgomery. It's like a lot of carries that aren't going to be efficient. I right? 3.8 yards per carry last year. Mediocre touchdown totals, uh, mediocre receiving totals. I'm just, I'm just not in on David Montgomery this year. I just the Chicago Bears offense. I'm, I'm very much willing to be wrong on David Montgomery, but the Bears offense is just one I'm not, not buying into. Travis Etienne, on the other hand, is someone I can get behind. So maybe I need to move Travis Etienne over David Montgomery. I think David Montgomery deserves enough respect though that he should be above Etienne because Etienne hasn't done anything on the NFL field yet. But I'm ready. I'm ready to fucking see it. You know, I went in on, on uh, Travi Trav. In that same video, I talked about Aaron Jones, the must draft running backs video. So again, make sure you go check that out. I went in on ETN and I love this dude. I'm all in, right? Super duper in. Size, speed, receiving ability, paired with his college quarterback. We'll see a much better season from the Jacksonville offense without Urban Meyer there. James Robinson ripped to that fucking Achilles. It was always Travis ETN. And I'm in on Travis ETN big time. And the last guy that will round out the top 20. I know y'all yelling about a whole lot of shit. CEH, Josh Jacobs, fucking all these washed up bums who you got as running back 20 based on the list that i've given you so far 19 drop a comment down below i'm curious how y'all how y'all would uh wrap this list out because it could go you know dobbins Brees hall josh jacobs uh damian harris gibson clyde you know kareem hunt whatever chase Edmond. like well you guys can go however you fucking want to i will not be i will be going with elijah mitchell here at the running back 20 He's currently going, I, I thought I, I thought this was like a fade by me. I was like, I'm way lower on Elijah Mitchell than consensus. Turns out not the case. He's going off the board right now at like pick 70 RB24, um, which I feel like sharp people are trying to get a little bit too sharp. They're sharp, but they're, they stab themselves. There's something about Elijah Mitchell that makes me nervous. To the, the overall sentiment of when I started writing up my outlook on Elijah Mitchell was more towards a negative sentiment because I thought I was going to be a lot lower on him than than the public, but it turns out it's not the case. There's something about him that makes me a little bit nervous. Like one of the most impressive rookie seasons we've seen from a late round running back, like on a per game basis ever. Okay. Like his raw numbers are great by themselves. 1100 uh, yards from scrimmage, six touchdowns for a six round pick. Incredible. If you look at his 16 game pace though, 300 carries, 1400 rushing yards, seven touchdowns, another 200 through the air. So you're looking at 1600 yards and eight touchdowns. That's almost Najee Harris numbers. You're looking at almost a similar rookie season to Najee Harris. Mitchell only played in 11 games last year, which is why I brought up the per game number basis. It's a common theme with the San Francisco running backs. It's missing time. They drafted Tyrion Davis Price, third round, so legit draft capital. They re-signed Jeff Wilson, which pretty much tells you all you need to know about Trey Sermon, but Trey Sermon is, is still there, you know? Uh, it's Mitchell's backfield for sure. No doubt about it. He's a starter. Earned that. Going to be. His passing game usage uh, is obviously a concern. If Trey Lance is under center, him taking carries is a little bit of a concern. Him not dumping the ball off to the running backs, as most, most mobile quarterbacks don't do, is another concern. The chatter out of camp is at TDP. Tyrion Davis-Price is going to be getting a lot of like thumper early down work. 
And I don't think that will really eat away from Elijah Mitchell's carry total. So I still think he'll get, you know, 17, 18 a game. But it concerns me on the goal line because we've seen they like to use a single back on the goal line for whatever reason. I don't know if that's going to be Mitchell. Maybe it is Mitchell, and this argument's working against me. But we've seen games with Jeff Wilson scoring fucking nine touchdowns in a game. All right? They put one guy on the goal line. They say, it's working. Let's just shove him up the middle. That could be TDP. Could be Jeff Wilson. Could be fucking Trey Sermon for all we know. There's just something about it where, like, I have a really hard time entering the year and saying, you know, at the end of the year, when week 17, 18 rolls around, you know, everything broke right for Elijah Mitchell. It just never happens in the San Francisco backfield. I just, that, that, I just get whiskey dick on drafting him, right? He's not a complete fade for me again. Like I will, I'll gladly take him again, where he's going off the board. If he's the RB 24, 25, 70th pick overall, like, well, give me all of that. Give me all the fucking Elijah. But if he starts to creep up into the top 15 conversation, it's where I pull the fucking brakes back, right? It's where we hit the brakes hard. That's the top 20. Again, if you uh, missed the video in which we talk about the running backs, we are not hitting the brakes on. The must draft running backs from last week, Aaron Jones, Travis Etienne, three or four, six other guys. Make sure you go watch that video. We'll put it on the screen for you. Link it in the description. Go check out FelixGray.com. Use promo code BG15. I promise you will not regret buying these bad boys. And you will not regret getting the draft guide. All right. PrizePicks.com. Use promo code BDG. 100% deposit match plus free access to our website, BG.co. That is it. I love y'all. And I'll see y'all probably tomorrow for a live stream. So make sure you're subbed because you'll get a notey for it. Oh, <laughs> oh,